greetings to everyone, and thank you for joining this session. We are going to answer to so many questions, but in the core of our discussion would be the universality and centrality of human rights that needs to be guaranteed in responses to crisis. My name is Dafina Petsi. I work as a Secretary General for National Youth Congress of Albania, Tirana European Youth Capital 2022, and it's my pleasure to moderate this session. As we all know, we are in the edge of an epochal change. We have been receiving different signals, but also being part of processes which are more and more difficult to process. The war in Ukraine, which has generated largest displacement of people in Europe since the Second World War, the increase in urgency and impact of climate change, the consequences of COVID-19 pandemic, and also the fact that we are facing all of this in a new area of digitalization, technological information and developments, which we are trying to catch up with. It has put the fundamental rights and freedoms under a serious threat. It's not a need or it's not that we have to, but I think we all agree that it's a must to think jointly and to use the convergence of revolution as the only model, the only path to benefit for a common good. To these ends, I would like to get started today's discussion, and I'm very happy and proud to have here with me Mr. Ivan Blažević, director from Solidarna, a foundation for human rights and solidarity in Croatia. Thank you and welcome. Leila Kajacic, Special Representative on Migration and Refugees, Council of Europe. Thank you and welcome. Nika Kovac, Director of 8 March Institute in Slovenia. Thank you and welcome. Mr. Michael O'Flaherty, Director of EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. Welcome. Angus Robertson, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for the Consultation, External Affairs and Culture in Scotland. Thank you and welcome. I would like to start this conversation with Mr. Blažević. Since um, there is a principle which is worth defending, and it's called solidarity, which has received a lot of attention also during the latest crisis, pandemic crisis. If human rights crisis call the solidarity at all levels, how do you think we can progress towards that end? And which target groups are those which have been more difficult to be understood, but also to be put in the common ground with decision makers and people who really had something in their hands to do for the common good. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, solidarity has become a big phrase in the last, well, five to ten years maybe. And I'm not sure that we still have an agreement what solidarity is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what the idea, the idea behind is. Um, I don't have the, 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 the right answer. If we would just go um, to, the, um, to Christianity, what their solidarity is, it's about, um, through time, it got with, then, uh, uh, with the New Testament and, uh, and with Jesus Christ, solidarity is helping those uh, which are not in your community. So before that, you're helping those in your community, the others are still the others. With, uh, 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 with the New Testament came solidarity towards the others. So uh, um, that's the idea. I'm not sure if I got your, uh, uh, your question right. Uh, is it what we can do to support better solidarity? Well, was that the, the... Especially, yes. Especially in the case of those vulnerable groups, which are, let's say, many times excluded when it comes to, let's say, uh, response to crisis? I mean, um, in crisis, we see what solidarity is, what solidarity uh, uh, can become. I'm just, I'll just give an example of the earthquake that hit Croatia, well, a year and a half ago, a little bit more, more uh, um, than that. That was, I think, the first time after the war in ex-Yugoslavia that no one has asked anyone about his or her ethnicity. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really uh, what happened, what uh, uh, stunned me. That lasted for three months, maybe four. 
After that, then we came back into our uh, uh, usual narrative, uh, so to, so to say. And we, do, I mean, we don't we don't see that the culture is changing. The culture is changing. The, the institutional framework for solidarity. I mean, we have to define what solidarity is in order to get it into into the institutional uh, institutional framework. So the debate is, we still have to to get there uh, in order to to anyhow instrumentalize it. I mean, uh, we've seen progression from, let's say, uh, um, frameworks, paradigm shifts from, I don't know, millennium development goals to the sustainable development goals. There was quite a positive, uh, a positive shift, shift there. But we're kind of still struggling, uh, struggling to get hold on it. And uh, I think what uh, Sir Tony Blair uh, uh, told us this morning, we have to have a plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are constant uh, mode of crisis, either be it the pandemic, now the war in Ukraine. We had earthquakes, uh, earthquakes as well, environmental crisis. So we're every day struggling with those crises which are here now, but we're not progressing in kind of bigger, bigger plan in the in the, in a bigger uh, picture. I don't know if I answered your your question because I said, I think. This question about solidarity, what it is, we have to be uh, first still talking on a, let's say, philosophical, philosophical level to get uh, hold on 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 the on the on the phrase, on to get a definition at least. Thank you, Ms. Kajic. When we think of threats posed to fundamental rights, one of the groups that comes into our mind, and um, it looks like the history repeats itself, are the migration flow and migrants. We had the migration crisis in 2015 and we are facing now a new area. I would like to hear from you what are some lessons learned from the crisis management back on that time that could be applied in this context? And also, how do you perceive the um, social engagement or mobilization of people in terms of supporting institutional behavior towards this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also for this invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here as a special representative of the Secretary General on Migration and Refugee Issues of the Council of Europe, uh, which is, as you know, wider than the European Union, we 46 uh, member states. Um, it, and thank you for devoting a panel, a dedicated panel to human rights. Uh, it's. Uh, it's very much appreciated. And I think that uh, what I would like to say is that the Council of Europe human rights system, which was uh, established 70 years ago after the Second World War, this human rights system, this collective enforcement of human rights uh, is more needed than ever today. So thank you for, 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 for this panel. Um, uh, I said uh, collective enforcement of human rights. This is what we are doing, and we all have a role to play mm -hmm. in this. And my role is, uh, I mean, you're talking about the 2015 uh, crisis. Uh, this role that I have was created in, at the beginning of 2016 uh, as a response to, to, to that crisis, to help member states to tackle their challenges related to the protection of uh, to the protection uh, of the uh, of the migrants and the refugees our basis the basis of my work is the european convention on human rights complemented by other uh, standards that that we have uh, in the council of europe um, uh, uh, all the conventions that we have and all the mechanisms that we have the, 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 the Committee for the Prevention of Torture, the Anti-Trafficking Convention, the Lanzarote Convention, dealing with uh, sexual uh, uh, exploitation, uh, sexual abuse of children, how to fight uh, violence against women. I mean, we have a number of conventions and monitoring bodies, and from these stem a number of obligations for member states that we all need to uphold together now uh, in the current crisis. Uh, what uh, we have done 
is, of course, the 2015 crisis has learned us. We had a number of tools, and we have adapted these tools to the current situation. That is, uh, our monitoring bodies have issued guidance notes uh, uh, on how to fight against trafficking. The, the majority of the people having fled Ukraine, as you know, are mostly women and children. We have a particular attention for vulnerable groups. So we have adapted all this so that we are useful on the ground. I think that is the key, to, so that uh, we can have an impact on the ground, so that we can help the authorities, but not only the authorities, also NGOs who were very, very active in this crisis, uh, and work together with, with uh, other uh, human rights bodies, national human rights bodies. The importance, I think, is the response we give to these crises and how we can make a difference on the ground and how can we help protect uh, better uh, from a human rights point of view all those who, 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 have, who had to flee um, uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Um, that was your question. I hope I, I, I got it. But, but maybe we can we can re-elaborate, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. and come yeah, back. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Kovac. Um, as a founder of an institute which, uh, let's say, uses storytelling and advocacy methods to confront gender and economic inequalities in your country, in the society, how? Can these tools work to engage more the community? And I would really like to hear from you also the level of engagement of young people. How interested are they and how much supportive have they been towards your mission? Uh, so, hi also from me. Um, yeah, so what we do is that we always ask people how they are. We believe that you have in one point like you have institutions, in the other point you have like people in positions in power and on the third point you have the people who are actually living in the country, who are actually experiencing the situations. And like what we found out through uh, the Me Too campaign which um, happened a couple of years ago is that from personal testimonies we can really well see what doesn't function in the society, why those things doesn't function and from concrete cases we can do analysis of the laws um, of the procedures and tell like what is not working and what should be changed and how and we also believe that like um, we need to distinguish always between um, governments between the state and between the people and um, I strongly believe and I'm saying this all the time that people are like willing to help each other, people have like a strong empathy, people want to build communities even in this isolated world and when they hear stories from the people um, they are willing to help and they want to be politically engaged. And uh, other thing that I um, believe is that uh, politics will change things just when they will be afraid of the people. I don't believe like that um, there are like good people in the politics in a sense that they will just do things because they are right. Mostly this is not the case. Mostly political parties are deciding on public opinion polls, they are deciding what it is good for the party now and on the interest of many other factors that we sometimes don't see. But when you have a group of people wanting a change, when you have a group of people who is saying, guys, this is your responsibility to change this, um, they will do stuff and um, they will move the other direction. And when this happens, when um, people come together, when they demand change, when they want change, and when um, politicians and in institutions um, listen to them, they give them a proof that their voice matters. And I don't believe in that, like, um, I'm like I'm not used to that fancy event, so I will speak like more. Like I don't believe in this like shit, of, which is like young people are not engaged. Young people are not engaged because until now there wasn't a moment in, in history when our engagement mattered. But when we discovered that we can go on referendums, that we can go on elections, that they will listen to us and they won't just give us like pre-election promises, we found like a lot of value in political participation. And that's how like young people are engaged and when young people are engaged, all generations came and help. What is the special thing on storytelling? Why storytelling? 
I think that like when you speak about experiences of the people, these are never empty words. Like sometimes when I like when I listen to discussions, um, I have a feeling that we always speak a lot about abstract things like um, human rights, uh, solidarity, which we never know what actually means for someone. But when we say, hey, human rights are like something that we need to understand in concrete cases, they are also connected with politics. So in countries where, for example, um, on elections wins the a party which has the most money and the most capital and laws allow like companies to finance, finance the campaigns, this is not like human right to vote in a concrete sense. Or another example, I also believe that when we are speaking about like human rights, um, we need to understand the complexity. We cannot just speak about human rights in Slovenia or even in the capitals, or like we need to understand the relations between like center and periphery in a really concrete cases. Um, we have one amazing NGO um, in Slovenia, which is like Delovska Svetualnica. They are working with um, workers from third countries. And we are always saying in Slovenia we have like a good laws about uh, workers' rights, but then through their stories we discovered that basically they are like slaves in Slovenia. Mm -hmm. So power of stories are that they are giving us a chance to understand the society in which we live. And um, when we understand the society, we can change it. Thank you. Mr. O'Flaherty, it's my pleasure to see you again after Fundamental Rights Dialogue and Fundamental Rights Forum 2021. I know that the institution you represent, but also in personal level, you value very much the engagement of young people and you have dedicated programs and activities to that. And I would like to make a praise on that. As we have understood also from the discussion, um, human rights protection cannot be only a response in times of crisis. Because when you are in a certain crisis, I mean, you try to, to deliver, you try to solve, but there are so many things that can get lost because you don't have enough time to process and not always you do the right, um, the right deed, uh, give the right direction. But it's, let's say, a matter to be sustained in a structural way and also multidisciplinary responses are needed. I would like to hear uh, from, from your perspective uh, upon certain multilateral measures for an effective response to prevent crisis, or at least to mobilize society and institutions both to be more engaged towards one another in dialogue when a crisis is happening, because we never know how much it's going to last, but what we know is that we have only one another. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Dafina, and my thanks to, uh, to Bled for inviting us. Um, the fact that there's a human rights panel mm -hmm. is important. The fact that it's rare it tells us everything we to know, uh, need to know about the issue of human rights and crisis, the, the, the original title for the session. Um, look, I'll answer your question, but before that, I have to react to a few of the things I heard, if you don't mind. I, it occurred to me, listening to Leila uh, talking about migration, that how we've handled migration since 2015 demonstrates the remarkable weakness of human rights in Europe, but also its strengths and its potential. Weakness. It's a weakness that there are people in the forests uh, on the Belarusian border. It's a weakness that people drown in the Mediterranean because there isn't enough search and rescue capacity. It's a weakness uh, that uh, people are stuck in places like Greece and they're not able to f move to other parts of Europe to engage in the solidarity that Ivan mentioned at the very beginning. These are disturbing weaknesses, wake-up calls, big flashing lights that our system isn't what it needs to be. But also much quieter, a lot less attention, achievements. I think of the cooperation between the Council of Europe uh, and people such as my own agency, which has massively intensified uh, it, with the migration crisis. We recognized we needed each other. We need the amazing work the Council of Europe was doing, for instance, through its, uh, its, its, um, its uh, 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 Prevention of Torture Committee, the CPT, and how that feeds into the work we do in the EU. Uh, that was a quiet achievement, but an important one already beginning to answer your question. Uh, and maybe just to take one other achievement, the situation of children. Um, when I first went to the camps in 2015, there were children in cages. 
Um, you can still have bad conditions for children today, but there's been a radical change in understanding of child protection, guardianship. That's an achievement for the long term. So forgive me for reacting to Leila. I thought in a way just that migration sums up the whole story of where we are right now with human rights in Europe. And then in terms of going forward, Nika showed us the way forward. Um, she, she reminded us that there's fantastic goodwill in society. Uh, that's evidenced by the social movements. Um, uh, our societies want to change the world for the better. Um, uh, and and that, that drive is primarily one from young people. And by the way, that's not just rhetoric. We know it from our surveys. Time and time again, when we disaggregate, looking at groups in Europe, uh, their attitudes, their behaviours, we see that the, the younger the cohort, uh, the more engaged it is socially, the more concerned it is to put politics at the heart of society. Uh, and the... Um, uh, I also thought uh, uh, that uh, Nika went further. She also showed us how part of how to fix the rhetoric around human rights, how to do much better messaging through stories, for example. And uh, so we have a lot to learn from you. Uh, and thank you for what you've said. And now I've almost forgotten your question. Uh, <laughs> I can repeat it. This was a want. sophisticated <laughs> attempt to evade your question. Um, no, look. Um, Human rights isn't just for time of crisis, but I'd even challenge that statement because, okay, it's not always crisis for us, but it's always crisis for a Roma in some disgusting facility that they've been shoved into by society. Every day is a crisis for that person. Every day is a crisis for the, um, for the person in some horrible reception facility for migrants. Every day is a crisis for the unfortunate person you'll see asleep on the street. So we're never without crisis. We always need human rights to respond to crisis. But in the terms of your question, it has to be a long-term investment. Uh, we need to uh, reintroduce human rights as a topic in school. Somebody in another panel talked about uh, teaching uh, media literacy in school. Uh, well, it doesn't have to be yet another subject. They're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, but those values, human rights is really the only universal ethical set of values we have anymore. Uh, and so they need to be high up in the curriculum for, for children. Uh, we need to, and I'll only mention one other thing, we need to re-engage the street. I talked about how people are decent, people have values, they want fairer societies, but they don't necessarily get human rights. Again, we know from our work that there's a very common perception out there, and maybe it's why this room isn't full, frankly. Um, the people perceive human rights as important, but it's for somebody else. It's not for me. It's not for my family. But it, we've got to show that it is about me and my family. It's about my, my grandmother in a nursing home. It's about, um, it's about the fact that, about us getting our house heated uh, in the coming winter. Uh, it's about putting food on the table. Uh, and it's only when we successfully convey the message that this is human rights uh, that I think we'll, 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 it'll be much more, to, again to use the word from earlier, much, much more resilient and embedded in our mm -hmm. societies. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, especially for answering my question in the end. <laughs> oh, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> no, no, no. Mr. Robertson, uh, I'm very curious to hear your stance uh, to a long-standing debate upon the degree of which international, economic, social and cultural rights should be given the same legal protection and also, um, let's say, uh, social support in national and domestic law. We know that uh, not long ago, in 2021, the Scottish government uh, proposed a new human rights bill that uh, would incorporate into Scots law four of U UN human rights, um, let's say, treats, including yep. legislation that enhances human rights for women and minority and ethnic communities. I would like to hear your perspective and, and thoughts upon that. <coughs> well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be back in Bled, and thank you very much to everybody uh, who's here, and it's really good to join a panel that is made up of the third sector multilateral organizations. And I guess I'm, I'm here as a representative of a government that does have responsibility for delivering on, on human rights. Uh, and although Scotland's part of the United Kingdom, uh, in terms of the UK political context, it's Scotland's government that is in, in charge of human rights, human rights legislation, in terms of our domestic law and how that impacts on people. And you're absolutely right, although most people in the audience, I suspect, don't know this, um, is that not only have we uh, integrated uh, the lights of the European Convention on Human Rights in our domestic legislation, that is anything that I do as a government minister or we as a parliament legislate for, which contravenes anything under ECHR, can go straight to the courts. Mm -hmm. We've gone further than that. We've said uh, that we're in favour of incorporating 
uh, other uh, UN conventions, so mention was made of the uh, conventions on the rights of the child. Um, I, I don't need to get caught up in this tremendously, a bit of a frustration for us, of course, though. We managed to have that legislation passed unanimously in the Scottish Parliament, and then sadly was challenged in the courts by the UK government. Um, and so th the point I want to make about all of that is, I think if, if there's a willingness in politics to make human rights agreements, conventions, standards, part of um, your own legal framework, I, I think we should. And it then holds people like me, a government minister, uh, or the government in general, uh, to account for what it is that we're doing or what we are not doing. Um, and there's a little bit of me, sometimes when I hear discussions about human rights, it, there's almost a sense of we need to reinvent the wheel. And I'm not sure that we do, mm -hmm. because there are great minds who for decades have come up with absolutely fantastic, first-class, mm -hmm. uh, human rights-related agreements of all sorts. Um, and notwithstanding the fact that we can point to many things and say, well, that's not working, that's a bit of a disappointment, couldn't we do more with that? Well, surely that's the point. It's about raising our game, uh, which is why I'm a great supporter not only of incorporating human rights legislation in a domestic context, but frankly also upholding it internationally. Um, because that's the other part of the problem, which is people th may think it's not for them, but they also might think it's nothing to do with me because it's, it's even further than um, an issue for nation states. And the point of crises uh, has, been, has been brought up. Well, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news because it does seem to be one crisis after another. But, I mean, do we really think that global warming's going away? No, it's not. Do we really think that the population movement from poorer countries to richer countries is going away? No, it's not. Do we have any idea how serious the cost of living crisis is going to be? Next month, the month after, when it gets cold. It, it, what that alone is going to do, sorry, just one little fact that I read this morning that just blew my mind, was that somebody had calculated this morning that you have to earn £104,000, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to work out what that is. Let's say for sake of argument, it's €150,000. Am I out? That's, is, that's roughly speaking correct. Yeah. A bit out. How much? <laughs> right, it's a lot of money. €120,000 a year if you live in Shetland, the islands to the north of the Scottish mainland, to not find yourself in fuel poverty now. In one of the most energy-rich parts of Europe. I don't think we have any idea about the social tensions that they're likely to be, the individual and family calamities, uh, people having to decide whether they're going to heat or eat. I mean, I know I'm digressing from the subject, um, but I, you know, I think it's important to put out the scale of the crisis that's befallen us, but you know, let, let's also bear in mind that we have gone through uh, crises. I know this part of the world because in a previous life when I was a journalist I covered this part of the world um, uh, and that was at the, uh, the beginning of the conflict in the then former Yugoslavia. And people forget that there are 300,000 refugees from this part of the world went to the country to the north of here, to Austria. It's one of the biggest movement of refugees in post-war Europe per head of population. Massive. And now we see what's going on with Ukraine. Disproportionate amount of um, people have, have gone to Poland, for example, uh, and we think of how Polish society has reacted to a crisis. And you can do nothing but tip your hat and say, there by the grace of God, we have not had to deal with this, that scale of crisis. But my point is we are challenged, we have been challenged, we are being challenged now, we're going to be challenged in the future, but let's not reinvent the wheel. We have, we have great human rights standards, we have international organisations that are responsible for making sure that we try and deliver on it, and thank goodness we have the third sector, which is reminding us when we don't. And uh, I think... If we, if we understand that symbiotic relationship that we have and hopefully the aspiration to support human rights and not undermine it, we might come onto that because unfortunately some people are trying to undermine human rights, uh, then let's try and go in a positive di um, direction and, and be the best selves in, in delivering on human rights that I thought we've all signed up to.
interesting. Can I give a small reminder? Of course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> like, I, I agree with the question, like, will the global warming go away? The answer is no. But I think the more important answer is why. And the answer why is that we are being day by day convinced that the global warming will go away if we will drive, te drive Tesla cars and put the, our trashes in the right bins, not, like, demanding from politicians to, like, make the things work on the systemic level, to change the laws about corporations, to change the laws about environment, and to build public transport in a way that we will use it, because, and to change everyday practices. Why? Like, migration won't also go away, because in the European U Union, we put the refugees sometimes back through Croatia with pushbacks. And then we left them in Bosnia to live there in the really bad conditions. And we are pretending that then the Europe is clean and better. And I know that there are enormous efforts that are put like in the um, that situation, but still we cannot like pretend that that is not happening. And also what we showed with the Ukrainian crisis is that there suddenly are rooms for refugees in every country and that people want to help, but just when the person who is a refugee is the type of a refugee that we want. And I think that those are also the questions that we need to ask ourselves, even though they are uncomfortable and they're hard to answer. Nika and Ivan, I would like also to hear from you since categorized as a third sector which has been showing uh, that is sensitive and proactive, but also we face a lot of challenges. I come also from the same sector, sustainability, capacity, um, how much access do we have in certain processes and how much welcomed are we when uh, decision makers and institutions are talking about um, crisis management. I would like to hear from you certain challenges that you have faced in some of the crises that we have already mentioned, but also it would be good, I think, not only for the panel, but also for the audience, success stories. <laughs> well, <coughs> just to add, uh, uh, add on you, uh, I would really like that we have someone from the private sector here as well, <laughs> talking with us about, uh, about human rights, not that they have another panel uh, on just sustainable development uh, and ESG, CSR, however you wanna, uh, uh, you wanna name it. Um, I think that, I mean, cross-sector partnership is crucial for, for human rights as such. I mean, for any kind of, of, of proper problem solving, at least, of those wicked problems, uh, uh, so-called. Uh, so, I mean, we've seen shrinking of civ civic space uh, uh, in, in Europe, especially in, in, in some countries like Poland, Hungary, uh, I mean, even, even Croatia as well. Uh, so, of course, the dependence of the non-profit sector uh, on, on public funding which is actually instrumentalized. Uh, let's let's be clear on on uh, on that. On the other hand, of course, we have we have some uh, uh, success stories, some good practices. Here's here's an example, um, Croatian example. So, uh, going to go back again uh, uh, to the earthquake. Seven days after the earthquake, we established the coordination of all actors which are not public into a coordination uh, for sharing information, working together, and so on. No public body was in there. Only the ombudsperson was there uh, uh, from public institutions, but all the others didn't want to get, get inside. Less than a year, year and a half later, here comes the war in, in Ukraine. Uh, we're expecting refugee crisis. The state puts up a coordination with all uh, uh, public and non-public private, private uh, actors, even business associations uh, in there. So obviously something has has been learned um, out of it. Um, I think we tend to, um, and it's also also related to the civil society, we, in every earthquake we said, oh, civil society, they're so great. They, uh, uh, they're reacting like, like that. They, uh, uh, they experiment, they, pr they, they get, they get uh, uh, social innovations and so on. But we tend to forget crises that we that we go through. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's in the human nature to to forget bad things in a broader sense. I mean, we forgot a, a, a pandemic that happened what a hundred years ago. We didn't learn any. I mean, we didn't learn anything from it, or at least what we learned, we didn't we didn't use it. In ex Yugoslavia, we had an emerging pandemic in the 60s, which has been dealt uh, uh, um, properly. 
so regarding civil society, it's something uh, uh, with the crisis, we tend to forget the value uh, of the civil society uh, um, after the uh, uh, crisis ends. And of course, there's the, the, the populist political movement where the civil society is just a, a, basically a scapegoat. So not many success stories. So story, sorry, <laughs> sorry for that one. No, uh, look, sometimes, sorry. I asked for positive and, and success stories, but I think the most important thing in this room is what, to be real and to talk really what, what, what is hurting us in, in yeah, everyday what, life and go for joint What joint I've seen, solutions. well, at least in the last maybe five, five years, five to ten years, that um, business and non-profit partnerships are, are really rising. Uh, I mean, it's on the one hand, it's a demand of, of the market, mm -hmm. of customers, that they, want, uh, that they want companies that have some kind of social value, so they say. I mean, if, if tomorrow, when you wake up, there are no more uh, Mars candies on the shelves, what's going to happen? Nothing. So customers are, uh, want businesses to have some kind of purpose. And that's what the third sector can bring them and give them and help them to better themselves, to better the, uh, uh, the society, and also uh, get the government uh, involved in, in proper sy systemic, systemic changes. And I've seen it in the last definitely five years that these kind of, of corporations really are, are emer emerging and having results as well. That's a, that is a positive example. Thank you. Thank you. Daphina, <laughs> Daphina could, could, could I just add something to, to, to what even has just been speaking about? First, I want to say I really welcome the way you framed the relationship with business. It's typically in a human rights discussion about business being a problem, and all the focus is on the remedy for the abuse by business. Very important. I'm not diminishing it, uh, but it's also about the necessity for partnerships. So I just want to strongly reinforce that. And I, I asked for the floor in particular because um, it's really important in this discussion, in this room, to acknowledge that civil society is under unacceptable stress just about everywhere. It takes different forms in different places, but we're constantly watching this, and we see right across every single EU member state there are issues about unacceptable pressure on this or that bit of civil society. It could depend on what you do. One topic will be far more received than another. It, there's many variables, uh, but, but it does need attention. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to say was you talked about a third sector. Um, in human rights, by definition, it's the first sector because human rights is about rights holders yeah. and civil society is in large part one of the voices of rights holders into the discussion. Uh, and you cannot do anything for people without being with people in human rights. And so, so the relationship is not an add-on, it's not a bonus, it's not something we do if we've got the time or the energy. We can't do our job without that very close partnership. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I think that what we proved in Slovenia in the last two years is that like um, democracy can be fun and that we can all participate <laughs> in it and that we can do amazing things and we have a lot of success stories. So um, everything began in the middle of the COVID when we wrote the law about redefinition of law about rape and we went on the street with uh, Institute 8 of March and our volunteers and we uh, brought the bill in the parliament and because we were using storytelling and we were like um, asking the victims of rape also to speak about uh, the cause um, in the times of the most right-wing government in almost Slovenian history, um, we pushed the law through with um, the support of all stakeholders in the National Assembly. Then we had a referendum against privatization of water, which was the referendum with the highest turnout in Slovenian history after a long time, and um, we won by 86%. Um, and we did it without like any money, with the donations, with um, people writing letters to each other with um, taxi drivers driving people to the polling stations. And then we also 
with a huge group of um, civil society organizations, like um, make the political participation in the elections like 20% higher, or we helped with it. So I think it is possible, but what are the lessons? The lessons are that like this is just hard work. There is no like quick recipe like to achieve those things, and you need to go on the street, you need to work 10 hours per day, and you need to speak about content, not about like, um, empty signifiers. And the second thing is that politics um, needs to be um, seen as an equal partner. I think there are two mistakes that we do in the civil society. The first is then whenever someone who is working in the National Assembly or Parliament um, comes into the room that we start to act stupidly and saying yes, 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 and being afraid. Like this is the first mistake. And the second is that we are just criticizing them. Um, we want like to work with them in some causes. We need to work with them. But when um, they want a picture with us or a support, we just go away because it is good to be like a clean Soul. So what we are doing in my organization is that we attack all of them if it is needed, mm -hmm. but we also support them, say thank you, and um, are really transparent about our working with politics. And that's how things can be done, and that's how like, the line between, between the people and the institution is uh, being erased. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, sure. I, I was going to make the next question, but I think that the most important part is there. So uh, let's go and see what your comments and questions are, please. Actually, I would like to add from here, applaud to Nika and her team, but uh, I also come from Slovenia. I work for the government, but I can tell you a, a good practice uh, mm -hmm. with the story. Now, human rights-based approaches in all areas of life and society depend on how much people know about their human rights and how they respect the rights of the others, whoever these others are. Mm -hmm. So you are all probably aware that there is a world program for human rights education since 2005, and Slovenia has been active in implementing it since then for children, because we feel that this is a long-term issue, and if you teach the children, they will be adults who have a human rights-based approach in everything they do, whatever they do. So a story, a good story, to be very short, from, from 2015 when there was a flow of refugees, about one million of people walking through our little country to reach the West. Usually the destination was Germany, but they went through Austria. Some, many stayed there, of course, as you said. Um, was what, how, how to make the awareness of our people here not to show hate towards all these foreigners. So one million people walking through a two million state. Now you can imagine that this was a very extraordinary situation. So what we did, I have a leaflet here, very, very simple. This is in English. If we, the children, are refugees in third countries, we have the right to appropriate care and protection. Okay, very easy, this was drawn by uh, two girls who are UNICEF ambassadors. There are a few simple questions. Who are refugees, asylum seekers and foreigners? Do you know any? Where are they from? What do they need most? How can we help them? And, and how can I help them? So very simple. And on the other side, it's about the Convention of the Rights of the Child and the two articles about it and who are migrants, who are asylum seekers, etc. So this was delivered. Um, well, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where I work, we printed it. We worked with the Ministry of Education to print 40,000 copies. So every third child in the elementary school in Slovenia got it. They talked about it one school hour. They took it home, showed it to their parents. Because this other page is for adults, of course. And uh, the atmosphere was much better after that. You know, <laughs> now when the Ukrainian refugees are coming, you know, it's somehow normal that we have a positive attitude to these people. Now, this is based on a program that we did since 2005, so we started 10 years earlier, it's a long-term issue, uh, with a program called Our Rights for Children, 
children just collect cards about their rights on the basis of, of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, but we also did it in Ukraine at the time. So now, with about three million Ukrainian children out of Ukraine being refugees in many countries, some also in Slovenia, not a large number, but still, we thought maybe we could do this project again to empower them and to empower the Slovenian children in their mother tongue. So we just have a print in the Ukrainian language. I wanted to show it as a good practice. And of course, we've done this with the civil society, NGOs all over the world in 26 countries, as I said, including Ukraine, and we'll do it again here for the Ukrainian refugee children. And without the civil society actors in so many countries, including in Russia, we did it even in Russia, in Beslan, in the school where there was a terrorist attack for the, for the children that survived it. Uh, so um, we did it all over the world. And I think this is one of the good practices we have to continue because awareness raising and human rights education is one of those strategic ways to change attitudes. And we have to start very early because it's the children that you have influence on. You don't have much influence on adults. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Robertson, you mentioned before uh, the fact that we don't need to reinvent because a lot of good inventions have been made already. There is a very uh, beautiful uh, Sumerian um, word just called amargis, co coming back to the mother. Mm -hmm. So in times of crisis, I think, even in personal level, we try to go back to the roots and see how everything started and why we are here. And also taking from the conversations that we had upon the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, having it for 70 years, why did we have this tendency to reinvent in order to go back to the core of it, which is human dignity and the responsibility from a person to a person, not people, not societies, but personal values. And I, I know that Mr. O'Flaherty as well has mentioned it in one of the speeches held. I would like to hear your, your um, comment in that. Um, it's turning into a philosophical session now. <laughs> um, as human beings, I mean, I think the point was made at the end is that we're, we're not very good at remembering things. We're also particularly not very good at remembering bad things because that's a, a way that we are conditioned to survive, isn't it? Uh, so we need to constantly remind ourselves of what we have done and where we are. And I, I think the, the Slovenia example is great. And I think one of the things that we, and I'm, I'm a great believer in this, when we hear about initiatives that are taking place elsewhere, which work, uh, we should relentlessly copy them. And so I'd, I'd love to look at the, the Slovenian materials that you've been using in your schools. We in Scotland and our schools have sort of human rights days, uh, days of international days of refugees. Our schools are very, very active. And I'm talking about primary education as well as secondary education. And you have to hope, don't you, um, that as that experience grows into adulthood, uh, that we live in societies that are b better grounded and aware of things. You know, again, getting back to the, the, the human condition, you know, how many countries go through the experience of having 50% of their entire population walking through their territory? I mean, that, you know, that is just off the scale. Um, so uh, going back to the, the, the immediate crisis point is there are big things happening out there, and it's perhaps easier for some of us in wealthier European countries who are perhaps not as exposed uh, to uh, migratory effects uh, or other uh, crises we heard about, earthquakes and, uh, and so on, um, that, that we are not impacted by some of these things. But the truth is, as time progresses and the world becomes smaller, we are all going to be impacted by all of these different pressures. So um, my appeal is just a simple one of, let's work out, out imaginative ways, and this is where I look to buy uh, colleagues from the Council of Europe or the, the, the European Union and, and others who work tremendously hard to try and communicate this. Uh, we were having a bilateral conversation. I hope you don't mind me talking about this, um, uh, about uh, 
best practice in relation to uh, managing Ukrainian uh, refugees. And there are some things that are happening in Scotland, as there were with Syrian refugees, where I think we've, we've done really, really good work in Scotland, and we should be very proud about it. No doubt there are other things that we have lessons to learn. And one of the things that I'm, pers I'm, I'm, I'm permanently on the lookout for is wa ways in which people like me, who make decisions, who help make laws, how is it that we can learn best practice? And that's why this kind of event, so let's give some further praise to Slovenia, please. Um, <laughs> it's events like this that brings people like us together. And um, so talking specifically about the Council of Europe, we're talking about a lot of the good work that's going on to try and find case studies. So what's happening in this country or that country? How's that working? What are we doing that fits into that? Because there are very few original thoughts out there. We should be honest about that, especially in politics. So where there are really good ideas um, in different places, let's adopt them shamelessly. I'm not saying we should claim them for our own, um, but we should just, and, and that's just my general philosophical approach to all of these things, which also goes back to the point about uh, human rights and, and all of the work that's gone into drawing up conventions across a panoply of subjects. Um, we, we just need to do our best to live up to that which we've agreed on and we haven't gone into it and maybe that's just because it's better not to go into the territory of things which are depressing. There are political forces out there, some of them mainstream, some of them in government, thank goodness not in my country, um, who would wish us to get out of international agreements, who'd, who would wish us to not live up to the agreements that we've signed. And uh, we need to be alive to that threat because there has been some mention of populist movements, but well, what about populist governments? Um, and we've had them in big countries and we've had them in small countries. Um, and unfortunately, we need to do much more to make sure that, because it's exceptionally destructive. We are, it, uh, we, we are living in an age where it is almost, not yet, but almost politically acceptable uh, to call for I don't know, leaving the European Convention on Human Rights? Imagine such an outlandish thing, joining the, uh, the likes of the Russian Federation and Belarus outside the European Convention on Human Rights. That's a position being actively considered by the government of the United Kingdom. So, wake up. We have to know what we're dealing with and we have to call it out. I'm not in favor of that. My government's not in favor of that and I hope common sense prevails. We cannot go backwards. We have to inherit what we've inherited, we need to deliver on it, and we need to build on it. And um, if we can take home lessons from Slovenia, I'd be delighted to do it. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, of course. Uh, Eng Angus put his finger on it just now in terms of what's different about our human rights crisis today compared to that of any other time. We've always had crises, we've always had problems, we always will have problems, but the qualitative difference today is the repudiation of the system. Uh, that's new. I mean, I remember back, um, I've been doing this for a long time, and I remember back uh, in the Bush years in the White House, and bad stuff was going on in Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere, but they fell over backwards to deny that they were torturing, because that was unacceptable. But today, you'll say, I tortured. It, and that's, that's a fundamental difference. We have to fight for the, the almost the sacred quality of the system uh, and its, 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 um, its core, its, its centrality to our civilization. Uh, and that centrality uh, um, uh, engages this issue of, of dignity that you mentioned. Um, the Universal Declaration, all people born free and equal in dignity and in rights. The whole edifice is built on the principle of dignity. Uh, and and, 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 and it's, it's irreplaceable. There's no plan B for human rights. Um, and uh, a human rights future is one where we, we, we celebrate each other's dignity, which means we celebrate our vast diversity. That's the strength of our society, not the problem of our, of our society. That's why I'm so disappointed in the news I read yesterday about Euro Pride being cancelled in Belgrade. It's, it's this cancellation of a celebration of human rights at the heart of our society. That's why it matters. Um, just briefly on the business of uh, do we have enough law? 
I I'm inclined to agree that when it, at least when it comes to the treaties, we've more or less got it in place. We just need to see it delivered. There's an argument to be made for sub-treaty regulation, for sure. Uh, but, but in terms of the big picture laws, we, 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 we have the system there. We just need it honoured. We need consistent political leadership that stands up for human rights, not episodic standing up for human rights, not patchy standing up for human rights. People are treating human rights today like it's a negotiation pack. It's not. It's a baseline for, for acceptable standards. Uh, and this isn't sufficiently visible in the action of the people who lead our societies. Later. Let me also add uh, something to what uh, the important things that you have uh, said. Um, I, I go back to the, you know, there is no need to reinvent anything. We have this convention system, but the problem is the implementation. And we have to, I mean, when we say we, uh, it has to be the government, because Civil society, I mean, it's, of course you, you, you have to, to play a role, but governments have to understand that uh, they have to implement. The, the, this implementation is very important. Without discrimination, without cherry picking, the convention applies to everybody without any distinction of race, of, of, of religion, of, of, of age, of, that it, that this has to be uh, implemented, and, and, and I, I really believe in it. So we, <laughs> and it has to be collective, because we have a common goal. Uh, yesterday I was listening to all the panels, we are talking about values, values. These are the values. Mm -hmm. and, and the implementation is important. We cannot just speak about them, we have to uh, implement. And about the dignity, it's the European Convention is also about dignity. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I'm thinking about, um, I don't know, migrants, as, as you were uh, referring to, who are in, for, for instance, detained, being pregnant, or children being, uh, migrant or refugee children being de de detained, for instance. Uh, these are human beings. They have to be treated as human beings. They have, uh, with, they have to be treated uh, in, in, in dignity. But all this has to be, uh, it has also to start from uh, scratch, as you say, as you uh, rightly pointed out. Uh, young generations have to be really educated in that, uh, in, in, in that uh, framework. And we, international organizations, we have to, put all our forces together, that's, I believe in it, we have a very good cooperation with uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency. For instance, we have, uh, every year we are publishing joint guiding, guidance notes, for instance, we, which, which encompass the standards of the European Court of Human Rights, but also of the European Union, which is, I think, great because it helps all the professionals. Uh, we, 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 we have one on border, uh, the rights of migrants and refugees on the borders, and we have one on, uh, I think it's investig proper investigations on the, on the borders, How, what are the standards? And we have it together, we have done it together with the Fundamental Rights Agency in one uh, document, and we have to continue this uh, uh, complementing one another. The international community has really to come together and cooperate and coordinate uh, more. That's at least what I, in my role, I'm going to continue doing and I would really like also to work more closely with NGOs because there are NGOs, for instance, which are criminalized because they are helping refugees. There are, there are certain member states where you, if you help uh, refugees you can find or you can be deprived of your, I mean, uh, you can, uh, it's, it's kind of criminalized. So uh, I also have, I would like to work on this more in my, in my role. Um, yeah, I think, uh, but, but, but we really have to also share the good practices mm -hmm. because we are an international organization, we have 46 uh, member states, everybody has something to bring uh, and to share this is, I think, invaluable.
and, and, and that's what I uh, think we should continue doing. Yeah, of course, please. I, com I completely agree with the implementation of our obligations, international and national, and we have lots of treaties, etc. We are missing one th thing, though, and Slovenia is striving also for that. We miss the group of older people. The demographics, especially of the Western world, is the way it is, and we feel there is a lot of need for a special convention for the older people. And there is a group of friends, Slovenia is in the lead in that, you know, to talk about the rights of the older people in the same sense that more than 30 years ago the international community talked about the need for the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the women's rights, and we believe now we are at the stage where we have to focus a bit more on the rights of the older people mm -hmm. because they are stigmatized, they are forgotten, and the COVID crisis has shown worldwide that that's the population dying because not only because they're old but because they were neglected. Their rights were not upheld in many countries including in my own. I'm a government person, I should not be saying this but I, I say it as a citizen and I think we should do much more on a national and international level. So this is not to be forgotten and we will go for it. Thank you, thank you very much for, for this uh, very um uh, good input. Actually, also us in our everyday work in the non-governmental, um, uh, let's say, sector with, with, with young people are more and more being aware that we are missing these intergenerational talks and intergenerational involvement and the importance of having this intergenerational cooperation in order to uh, remind us upon history their needs, but also without knowing what has happened, you cannot be clearly... Um, seeing towards the future and I think so many uh, important and interesting uh, aspects of, of uh, human rights were discussed here but what I uh, um, like the most is the fact that firstly from the institutional perspective the third sector is not considered third sector but first sector. Uh, secondly uh, that um, beyond the struggle that we really do have a civil society to respond and to be active we still have managed to create very positive examples and I think we should share more. Bled is exactly created for this. Uh, Bled as, 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 as a forum, not as a city. Uh, uh, to make sure that people are coming along, are sharing their best practices, are sharing their stories in a very tough and real way. Because it's not to polish, but it's not good also to be pessimistic. Mm, we have to, uh, we have to um, to look forward always. Um, mm -hmm. Of course. I don't, want to I don't want to interrupt too much, but there are two things. Firstly, older people, I won't get into the business of a treaty or not a treaty. I'm just saying, let's not wait for a treaty. Protect the human rights of older people right now. Yes. Uh, the, um, uh, it, it, it's shocking the c conditions in older people's uh, residential centres in many countries. Absolute disgrace. Uh, when I was running a National Human Rights Commission, we did an investigation. We saw how, in order to avoid overtime for the care staff, uh, people were fed at four in the afternoon and the next meal was at seven the next morning. Uh, and sometimes, to avoid them wandering around, getting lost and hurting themselves, they were literally locked into their chairs by tables being shoved against the chair. Uh, this, this, this is in Europe. You know, so for goodness sake, let's wake up our societies uh, to these issues right now, long before we get a treaty. And um, I had a second thing, and I wonder will it come in? <laughs> I wanted to react to something. Yes, it's about sharing good practice. I just want to agree with all of that. And I want to say something about the United Kingdom, if I may. We find in the human rights work that one of the greatest pities about Brexit is we've lost a treasury of good practice from the United Kingdom. As some, as some human rights gets done at the local level better in the UK than anywhere else in Europe. Uh, uh, human rights in, in policing, for example. First class work in, in many different parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, and, and I think maybe my point here, apart from acknowledging that with some sense of loss, is that we need to find new ways, maybe through the Council of Europe, of ensuring that this vast experience of the United Kingdom in protecting human rights continues to be fed into our discussions. Maybe some parts of the United Kingdom will come back to the European Union before then, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plan. Okay. In Scotland, at least. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> If there is any, any question or comments or something that you... I do have a question. When's it going to happen then? <laughs> You're all welcome to. Um, well, I mean, it's not the, it's not the topic of today's, uh, uh, of today's uh, debate. We had an election in Scotland last year and, and, the decision, and, the, and a decision was made. Mm. Um, I was elected in that, uh, in that election and we have the biggest majority in the Scottish Parliament ever uh, to have a democratic vote. And I... I don't know about you, but normal democratic countries allow the people to have democratic decisions about things, don't they? So I look forward to the United Kingdom recognizing the fact that we voted to have a say. I look forward to having a say, and we will talk about um, the options of uh, rejoining the European Union, and I am confident that we will make a decision to become a sovereign state that's a member of the European Union. Thank you for asking. And thank you for the applause, by the way, so as well. So. For, for as long as it serves to human rights protection, it's well, more than welcome. In this, but, but, in this okay, time. so let, let me segue into a, broader, into a broader point, which is there's, there's no point aspiring to being able to make certain decisions in better fora, such as the European Union, unless you're actually interested in trying to deliver the best. So let's be self-critical. I'm, I'm, I'm saying me as a politician and my caste, uh, which is, you know, we, we're in organizations like the Council of Europe. We're in organizations like the European Union, most of us, some of us hopefully soon again. And we do that because we believe in making better laws and upholding better standards. And I think just sometimes it would help to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, are we doing that? And where we are not, doing it better or being reminded. So, you know, I know we're probably kind of getting towards the end of the, uh, the session, but I would say to third sector colleagues on the panel here and elsewhere and back home, thank you for keeping the pressure up on people like me. I'm glad to represent a government that believes in incorporating human rights legislation in our domestic law. I would encourage others to think about that if they haven't done it already. It's a really tough test. Uh, because if, if you're then not delivering on what you've agreed to in lofty declarations and international summits, um, then you're going to be in front of the courts. And that's a really high standard. And, you know, um, what was said about older people, absolutely, we're trying to create a national care service in Scotland, like the National Health Service. But, you know, that is a big undertaking. And if you layer on top of that human rights standards, which one should aspire to, it isn't easy. But... Politics shouldn't be about the easy, it's about trying to do the difficult, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And doing the better. So, thank you for the encouragement to do the best we can. Please. Thank you. My name is Robert. Uh, I listened yesterday to the leaders panel and took away a lot this concern that now over the winter we are in danger of losing our empathy for the suffering in Ukraine. And Ms. Kovac reminded us how important empathy is as a basis for noticing and nurturing um, human rights. So what good practices, you panelists, would share with us? Um, what can we do to uphold empathy and nurture empathy? Um, what are good practices in terms of policies or actions you have been taking? Thank you. I think it's a really great question, um, and uh, it comes back to the business of telling those stories at the beginning. Um, it, empathy is triggered when you realize you're engaging with another human. Uh, 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 it's, it's, it's about somebody else. It's not just about an idea or something abstract or remote. So it's about telling stories, allowing people to tell their own stories. That's really important. And, um, and so we, we, it's in the Ukrainian context, uh, we need to... I, I'm not sure what, to what extent it's already happening, but we need to sh sh make sure we're hearing Ukrainian voices uh, in, 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 in our national media, um, telling the, what their experience of what it's like to live with us. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, another, another dimension is to, ch by the way, I wasn't there for those discussions yesterday, challenge them. Um, uh, we're, we're closely watching what's happening across all the member states. and I don't recognize uh, this, this growing unease which is about to result in a repudiation of Ukrainians. We see isolated pockets of it for sure. 
but by no means some big social movement. And by the way, to the extent that it's there, it's being whipped up by the far right. Uh, the, um, so let's be careful. So kind of first challenge the assumption, uh, th then allow the people to tell their own stories. And, cre and our job is to create the spaces, the means uh, for them to effectively convey their messages. Um, I have also something. I think that like we shouldn't forget that like we have written like in our states like systems of solidarity which are public health and public school system and like I think what all those crises in like intersection showed us that like the country didn't collapse like when the COVID crisis happened when they have a, had a good public health system or when they had a public health system at all so what I think is that like now and I'm also saying this like especially in Slovenian context and in broader context in Europe is that the worst thing that governments can do is that they start to attack those public services. This is what we need and this is the only thing that we, will get us through the crisis and this is how politicians can actually show solidarity. And uh, the second thing is like, not to always speak about third world countries. I was living one year in US and I saw like what happens when you are in a country without like with a shitty health system and with a shitty school system. Like only the rich can have like the basics of life. So when we speak about solidarity with the people, how to build uh, empathy, like empathy is taught in public schools, empathy is done in um, public health mm -hmm. systems and in hospitals. And this is what we need to stick on. We have two questions from the audience. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I actually, it's, it's a bit of a build-up um, question from the previous, so, so thanks a lot for kind of building up my case. Um, what I've been listening to um, and what I've been wondering since the beginning of the setting of the question of, of the definition of solidarity and all of that, what I'm interested in is in your opinion of when we're talking about human rights, what, what kind of sticks to me often is, is this kind of othering. Like, you know, human rights is something that we're driving for other people, all those pure, poor people from here, here and there. And what I'm missing from the conversation is that when we're talking about human rights, we're talking about our own rights. So when we're dealing with people that are struggling with getting their human rights met, we're actually fighting for our own rights. It's not a fight for that other person's rights, it's the same rights. I have been a child, I will be old. I mean, obviously my race is what it is, that is something that I anyway don't have control over, but it doesn't make me any less or more of a human being. So how could we influence that we, as a society at large, would understand that this othering is, is actually a big obstacle in actually working towards human rights. I'm hoping that I'm successfully um, driving what I'm trying to ask from you. What's your opinion on that? Thank you very much. Very, very good question. Feel so free to... <laughs> so firstly on the other thing, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, this sense that human rights is something over there I don't know how many of you are, are aware of a, a term that you hear a lot more of, certainly in the English-speaking world, and in a pejorative sense, which is the word woke. Have you heard that word before? For those of, for those of you who might not have heard it, it's a, state, it's a, it's a word that, if I'm, if I'm correct in this, um, it it's, uh, comes originally from African-American parlance, from being awake. So if you are woke, you are awake uh, to the realities of life in that particular context. Um, but it is now being cast back at those of us who care about the likes of human rights to say that somehow it's not, it's, it's, um, it's, it's illegitimate. It's not real. It doesn't reflect the realities of the real people out there, whoever the real people are. And then you have this, and then the othering gets worse because not only is their finger pointing at internal or external enemies or challenges, and we'll have examples in all of our countries, as unfortunately this is a universal uh, challenge, is it not? Um, but you then have the othering of institutions. So this goes back to the point of now actually, for the first time, living with challenge to 
international human rights institutions. And sometimes when I'm forced to, because I don't do it voluntarily, but there are certain newspapers I could point to who will literally report on um, uh, the European Court of Human Rights and other institutions as a, a sort of foreign, illegitimate um, uh, institution. Uh, and that somehow what it is that they are doing, using t this terminology, woke being an example of that, uh, to, to kind of delegitimize it. Now, we have to understand that for what it is. That is part of a strategy to undermine those institutions, to undermine those, um, uh, those standards, and to resile from them, i.e. to get out of institutions, to walk back from international agreements, to walk back from human rights uh, agreements, and so on. And we need to call it out for what it is. So that's one part of the equation. But the much better side of the equation seems to me, and this goes back to the education point, is we all need to understand that this is about us. And it doesn't matter if we're, you know, uh, what gender we are, what age we are, what sexuality we are, whatever it is, whatever our characteristics are. We are all human. So our rights matter to all of us, and we should care about one another's uh, as well. So how do we mainstream all of that? Uh, and the empathy point, let's go back to the empathy for a second. We just need to hear more from people who are at the front line of having their rights challenged. And so just one little best practice idea. So I have the good fortune to be um, Scotland's Minister for Constitution. Great, independence. External affairs, getting on with the world. That's a good thing. And culture. And we just finished the Edinburgh festivals, the biggest art festivals in the world. And they started with 15,000 free tickets for people to go and see um, an, a major event and a, a further event that involved the Ukrainian Freedom Orchestra, which was bringing together the best exile musicians from Ukraine and also musicians from Ukraine itself. And there wasn't a free seat in the house. And standing ovation and standing ovation, standing ovation. Empathy is still there. So when you hear from people who are affected, you cannot be, you cannot be anything other than impacted. And we just need to remind ourselves constantly to do that. Mr. O'Flaherty, and then the last question very quickly, um, because we are reaching the end. Sure. Uh, let me just follow on what Angus just said um, about uh, the Edinburgh Festival, and just recall you, we don't have time to discuss it, that another critical partner for promoting human rights is the world of culture. Uh, they're way more effective often than we are in conveying a message, in triggering empathy, uh, in, in bringing about the change. But now I want to come back to the point there. Um, I'll get straight to the point, as far as I see it. We will only succeed in helping people understand that human rights is about us when we get serious about socioeconomic justice. Um, socioeconomic justice is a matter of human rights. Uh, human rights is about a job, healthcare, education, uh, paying for the heating bill this winter. And only when we get serious about that and call it the business of human rights will people finally understand it's about all of us. And last thing, be careful with this word othering because human rights is also about the other. Human rights is about the forgotten people on the corner of our societies. We've got to find a future where human rights is about all of us, but the primary beneficiaries, the primary targets are the Roma, are the travelers, are the migrants locked up, uh, the homeless guy I mentioned sleeping on the street. Never forget them. It's about us, but it's also about these people who often don't have the agency and the voice to speak up for themselves. But I also think that there is like an unpopular opinion, which is that like us white people who, who are coming from like privileged part of the world, who are coming from middle class or higher middle class, sometimes we will be doing this. Like I think that not, not a single person of us um, can not um, make someone else other because we don't know enough about other continents because we are blind sometimes because it is just easier to be blind and because we are focusing on our world. And I think that the only way how we can overcome this is that we admit our positions, that we always speak about our privileged positions in this world, um, not forget about other continents and always think um, about inequalities and about human rights through economic perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Two last questions collected.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be very quick. Um, just going back to the to the beginning when the representative, the panelist from the Council of Europe, was talking about uh, the, the importance of the human rights system more, more needed than ever. I'm just wondering what's going to happen or what's happening with um, the Russian people now that Russia uh, has officially been uh, expelled and pulled out itself you know, from from the Council of Europe. The all the Russians are not protected anymore uh, by the human rights system. So what can we do? Thank you for the question. Let's take also the other one and try to merge the answer. Thank you very much. I'm Eva Tomic from Foreign Ministry of Slovenia and I'm sorry I missed part of the discussion. But uh, I really wanted to come in in the discussion uh, and based on the last question, we in Slovenia have seen in the past two years uh, how quickly your human rights can get uh, trumped upon, your right to free information. And what was for me the most shocking is was this, if I may uh, borrow this phrase, unbearable lightness of how fast this was happening and how things can start unraveling in the whole culture of fear. And when I think of human rights, I more and more think of exactly what Mr. O'Flaherty has pointed out, of the social importance of thinking of human rights in the uh, terms of social inclusion terms. And there is a direct correlation between um, social inclusion of the so-called the other um, and democracy that we observe after peace processes. Why do so many peace processes unravel and uh, erupt back into um, conflict state? because an effort is not made on social inclusion. And just, I really have to state this, but in Slovenia, the uh, turnover started with the inclusion, fantastic inclusion of civil society people. This is my one <laughs> occasion to thank from my heart. Uh, with the water referendum, and this was uh, amazing, it can be done, and then of course with the elections. But if you don't have social inclusion, including civil society organization, uh, your nexus to democracy is gonna be short-lived. And Thank maybe you. this is something that the Council of Europe can also um, de develop further. I, I, I just think it's Thank you. very important. Thank Sorry you. for Thank being you. long. Do we have an answer? And we really have to, uh, to conclude. Sorry. Thank yeah, you. Uh, th uh, about the Russian Federation, you know that the Russian Federation is not a member of the Council of Europe anymore. But there are things I have to check. I don't want to give you wrong information. But uh, what I know is that uh, individual applications can still be uh, made to the court until a certain time, which is, I think, September. Uh, September. <laughs> And, uh, and the court will have to decide how they are going to cope with uh, the cases. I know that they haven't uh, decided yet, but as I say, I don't want to say anything wrong because I am not on... Uh, uh, but uh, they will have to decide whether they will continue to examine the cases, even though uh, there is no uh, respondent uh, government. Uh, this decision will be taken by 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 the court. Mm -hmm. um, but the Russians who uh, live in uh, um, the other member states, they can still uh, make a, an application to the court. I mean, uh, the convention applies uh, to those who reside also in uh, other member states. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. In respect of the next panel, we have to conclude now. It was a pleasure and... I think that many valuable thoughts and discussion was held here today. Thank you and looking forward.